second years hello ready for 45 minutes of fun maths action let me just try and get the comments oh and then we shall start so answering questions at the beginning for those of you who haven't come to this before what is happening is that taylor tutors are offering three well we are offering we're doing free lessons every day for everybody doing maths biology chemistry a level um the information is all on our website in the examulance course which is our emergency pandemic examulance product <laughs> thing offering support help whatever like i'm not sure what the best word for it is we're doing our best we're making it up as we go along at the moment but i know that a lot of you are almost certainly going to be taking that exam in September. So we're working towards that. Okay, for the second years. So I will just share my screen with you so that you can see what I'm talking about. And then I will answer your comments about what we're doing. Okay, so the schedule that we are following is in study schedules, the examulance you can get from the Taylor Tutors website. Hey, we, no one needs to go to the exam hospital, exam hospital, because we've got the exam ambulance that's going to help you all, so it's all right. Here's our study schedule. The study schedule for second years is for just in case, because we do not want you to get to the point where you find out your grades, which is all the way down here, and then have five or six weeks to try to remember the whole A level, the whole two years, and go through past papers and then jump into an exam in September. So this is a gentle one hour a day, just in case schedule. And it is based on the plan that we've got here. But that is subject to change. I'm going to keep asking you what you want to do, and then we'll change it as we go along. How long is the live? 45 minutes. We always work in action hours at TT. Is this AS or A2? It's A2. AS was at 12. Which exam board is it? All of them. The rule for the exam boards for maths is that they all have to be exactly the same. And are you doing it every day? Yes, I'm doing it every day at one o'clock. There is also at four o'clock a study with me. So you can come along and um, just work while I'm working. I will be answering questions from inside the course from TT subscribers. So you can see what that's like. And I will encourage everybody to have their own target for that time and just work on whatever work your teachers are setting or anything like that. What else do you need in the exambulance? Well, the course maps is what we did yesterday. We had to look at all of the pure in the A-level and um, what Taylor Tutor's videos correspond to that. Now, today we're focusing on differentiation. So what I've done is for the next 24 hours, all of the differentiation videos in the content guide are going to be free for the next 24 hours. And that means that each day as we work through, you're going to be motivated to go look at those and make your notes and like complete that section of the course. Okay, so slowly over the course of the next few weeks, you will have access to probably most, probably not all of the videos. Um, obviously, only subscribers can ask questions. The notes that you can make are in the examulance as well. You can make revision notes and I'll reference this at the end of today, but the ones that we will be using or you will be using over the next 24 hours is this page here, differentiation. So this covers everything that you need to know on differentiation. And there is a video in the content guide where I go through this exact page and you can fill it in with me and we talk about it. So that is there waiting for you, okay? I think I will try to support you. Um, I think it might help if I get some links in the examulant specifically into the content guide. I will work on that today if I get a second, okay? Um, uh, YouTube says year 12 chemistry is live now. If not, I am. Year 12 chemistry. I mean, this is on YouTube, right? So yeah, differentiation is today. Um, we will cover a lot of it. I'm not going to do the one I'm definitely not doing today is the chain rule and implicit differentiation, connected rates and parametric. I'm going to give this its own lesson this week if it's needed, but if not another week. But the chain rule is really, really important. Okay. 45 minutes is the rule for action hours. The other rule for action hours 
is that we have a focus. Our focus for this action hour is going to be to understand what inflection points are and to practice integration at, because we have to do that every day because it's so hard. And as well, the third thing is, what's the third thing? Practice integration, inflection points and the derivatives. No, fully know the derivatives and how to prove them. Okay, that's our target. It's quite a big target for 45 minutes, but I'm confident. Okay, go. Right. You don't need anything but pen and paper during this. Right, this is in your examulence. It's called the map, the pure map. And we talked about it yesterday. We discussed what was done and not done. And we said that differentiation still needed little bits and bobs tying up. So it wasn't that it was not done, it just needed tightening up. So I'm gonna do two sessions on this one, this, this week or next week. So anything that does not have a circle around it is AS, so you already know that. And today we're going to be adding on the stuff that's in tutorial 21, which is inflection points and convex and concave and concavity in general. We're gonna talk about all 10 derivatives and we're also gonna practice a bit of integration. And we're gonna be talking about the proofs of the derivatives as well. I'm gonna assume that you know what the chain rule is and what the product and quotient rules are, but I'm not gonna go into detail about those today. I'm going to come back to the chain rule, implicit differentiation, parametric and connected rates, which is more or less all the same thing. So your playlist for the next 24 hours, should you want to watch it, is these videos. And they are all currently free when you go into the content guide, I've made them free. Okay, I will definitely 100% um, be doing integration too. Yeah, have a look at the schedule in the exambulance. But we can keep discussing it, okay? The reason that people are doing maths when there's no exams phase is that there are exams. The exams are gonna be in probably September and they're gonna be proper, proper exams. And if people don't like their calculated grade, which is to, uh, an aspect of that is what your teacher says, but it's not entirely what your teacher says. If you don't like your calculated grade, then you don't have enough time to fully revise if you wait. So look at the schedule in the examulence. Now, I'm gonna give you one, two, three, four, five. I'm gonna give you five, they should take about five seconds each. I'll give you 30 seconds each, that's one, two. I'm gonna give you three minutes, starting now. Scribble on a piece of paper what you think the answers to these are, three minutes. Got another 40 seconds. What, where does it say that chemistry is on now? 
because this is called year 13 maths live class. So I don't know where it says chemistry. Chemistry starts at, after, at two, first years at two, second years at three. So I don't know where it says chemistry is now, but it isn't, <laughs> right, 10 seconds. We're gonna start every session like this, okay? They're gonna get harder, the integrals. Right, the first one. Basically all of these, what you should be thinking is, what did I differentiate to get that, okay? What was it that got differentiated to end up with one over four X add one? Right, first one. What was differentiated is this. The derivative of ln, and I'm going to collect these on the side, the derivative of ln x is 1 over x. So when I see that 1 over, I know that what got differentiated was ln. Now, I need to think about this. What happens when I differentiate ln 4x add 1? I get 1 over 4x add 1. But the chain rule says I then multiply by the derivative of the inside. So ln 4x add 1, if I differentiate it, goes to 1 over 4x add 1, times the derivative of 4x add 1, which is 4. Now, is that what I want? Mm, no, almost, but I don't want that 4, thank you very much. So what you do is a small adjustment, and then that's the end. Okay, let me just get rid of this. I'm not pressing delete because last hour that went horribly wrong. The iPad had a right tantrum. So this is a quarter, and the quarter is there to deal with the 4, and the 4 comes from the chain rule. Chain rule, very, very, very important. Next, what got differentiated? Tan. Okay, the derivative of tan is sec squared. So tan x differentiates to sec squared x. So I know it was tan that was differentiated. Now what I do is I do differentiation in my head or I can do it at the side of the page. So tan, what would happen? I'd get sec squared, 4x add one, perfect. Then the chain rule would say that I've got to multiply by four. I don't want a four at the front there. So I'll just whack a quarter at the front to compensate. And now when I differentiate, I get sec squared 4x plus one, which means it's that. Are you following? Not one over tan. Oh, one over four tan, yes. I'm oh, sorry, I forgot, I didn't see where the fraction line was stopping. Next, sine, it must have been sine. The reason it must have been sine is sine differentiated is cos. Note that all of my thinking is in this direction. None of my thinking is in that direction. I don't look at cos and think sine. I look at cos and think, what would I have differentiated to get this is the way to integrate. It makes it much, much, much more successful. Always thinking in that other, other direction. So what happens when I differentiate sine? I get cos, brilliant, don't want the four, sorted, done. Next, what must I have differentiated? Must have differentiated that, mustn't I? Let me just jot down the other ones I've used. Cos goes to sine. No, when you differentiate cos, you get minus sine. When you differentiate sine, you get cos. This is differentiation. When you differentiate e to the x, you get e to the x. But when you differentiate a to the x, you get a to the x, ln a. Right. Let's do this one actually writing it down. If I differentiate 3 to the 4x add 1, I get 3 to the 4x add 1, ln 3. But chain rule, chain rule says I now have to multiply by four. Now, how much of that did I want and how much of that did I not want? I don't want the ln three and I don't want the four. Done. Finished. Okay. I really strongly recommend that, <laughs> this is gonna sound really stupid, but don't learn any integrals. Don't, don't think that integration is a process. As soon as you start thinking that integration is a process, your brain will get itself muddled. Whereas if you only think of differentiation as a process, then you're always coming back to what did I differentiate in order to get this? And your integration will get stronger and stronger and stronger very, very quickly, I promise. Right, there are two ways to think about this next one. Three, sorry and it's my favorite one, I love it. We could think of this as a half sine 2x 
Or we could think of it as sine x times cos x to the power of one. Or we could think of it as cos x times sine x to the power of one. They are all the same. That's legitimate. Okay. What did I differentiate in each case? Remember, I'm thinking in the other direction. I wonder what I differentiated. Well, this one I must have differentiated cos 2x. It's the only option. Now I think it through. Derivative of cos 2x is minus sine 2x times 2. Okay, I don't want a minus there. I don't want a 2 there. Actually, I do want a half there. So the answer is going to be minus a quarter cos 2x. So it's, it's guessing the structure of what must have been differentiated, then actually differentiating it using the chain rule. And then anything that's popping out the front that you don't want or that you do want, you can plonk at the front. What about thinking about it this way? What got differentiated? All right, well, I think that what got differentiated was this. So let me see if that makes any sense. No, absolutely perfect comment, Ruhab. We cannot do integration by parts for the last one. No, it's a really, 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 really important thing that integration by parts is not a method for integrating products. No. M nearly all of the products that I write down for you to integrate will not, integration by parts won't work and it will make it worse. So integration by parts is useful, but it is not how we differentiate things times together. Absolutely not. It's not the product rule for integration. For differentiation, the product rule. Two things times together, use the product rule. For integration, two things times together could be flipping anything. Probably not parts. I will go over parts at some point, okay? I will go over it. You, you know which one it is by thinking through the process and following the playlist that I'm putting together for you for integration. But for now, this is just a starter. I, all I'm doing is showing you a few at the beginning of every session, we're gonna do a little bit of integration. So why do I think it's sine squared x? The two would come down and change to a one, and then the chain rule would say, I multiply by the derivative of sine, which is cos. So this works perfectly, apart from I need to stick on a half there, done. What about the third way of thinking about it? Now I'm thinking, I know what got differentiated. It was cos squared x. Now let's think that through. What happens when I differentiate cos squared? The two comes down and changes to a one. Cool, then I get cos to the one, which is what I want. Then the chain rule says I need to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is why there's a sign sitting at the front there. So it's perfect. It almost is exactly right. But when the two comes down, when I differentiate, there would be a two there and I don't want a two there. So I'll just do that. And also the derivative of cos isn't sine, the derivative of cos is minus sine. So let's put that there to deal with it. And now that works perfectly. Okay. What is parts for? Very good idea. Very good question rather. Parts is almost exclusively for anything to do with learn and anything to do with x and then a learn, well, anything to do with learn, x times an exponential or um, x times trig, it's basically it. Anything to do with learn, x times, an, something to do with x times, some, times an exponentially thing. Learn is it, see, that's the thing. Learn isn't even two things times together, is it? If I write down the integral of learn x, that's parts, that's the main reason for using, parts for you guys in the A-level is because you're integrating learn. Learn isn't something times something, literally. That requires parts, okay? This does not require parts. Most things don't require parts. Even things that look like this might not require parts. So for example, this, not parts, no. This, not parts. Okay, so stick with me for the integration. Um, we will do a bit each day. Let's move on to the differentiation. 
So what facts do we need to know for differentiation? You do need to know all of the derivatives, sine, cos, tan, sec, cosec, cot, e, ln, a to the x and x to the n. But they're the 10 that you have to be able to differentiate and you have to know which ones are negative. And other than that, the other stuff, the chain rule, the product rule and the quotient rule, we add on to that, but everything else is sort of an, a use of it. The reason that I'm talking about convex concave and inflection today is that a lot of people haven't covered it. So it's a good thing to jump on and cover. Okay, here is a multiple choice question for you. The point one one on that curve, is it a max point, a min point, an inflection point or none of these? So how are we gonna, how are we gonna decide? We need to know facts about what is a max point what is a min point and what is an inflection point? Right. Tell me what is a maximum point? How would I check that something is a maximum point? How would I prove that something is a maximum point? There are two things. Yes, the Good, the second derivative is less than naught. d squared y by dx squared is negative. Is there anything else or is that it? Yep, second derivative is smaller than zero for a max point. Is that it? Is that the only thing? Let's check it then. dy by dx is three x squared minus six x plus three d squared y by dx squared equals six x minus six at x is one d squared y by dx squared equals six minus six, which is naught. So it's not a maximum point. But, ah, excellent, Cam, first derivative is zero. There are two conditions. dy by dx is zero. Good, same thing for minimum, two conditions. dy by dx is zero, d squared y by dx squared is positive. They're the conditions, okay? So it's definitely not a max point or a min point. Does anybody know the things we have to check for an inflection point? An inflection point looks like this. Here's a little ooh, inflection point there. What is both zero? One of those things is right, but not both of them. Okay, this is an inflection. This is what an inflection point looks like. It's where it, well, I'll tell you in a minute what it is, but the rules are, and the important thing is that the first derivative does not have to be zero. Don't get muddled with max and min. The first derivative is irrelevant for an inflection point. Nothing at all to do with the first derivative, nothing. It's all about the second derivative. So we need two things. We need d squared y by dx squared equals naught and we need either side, the second derivative to change sign. The second derivative is all to do with the second derivative, nothing to do with the first derivative. We need the second derivative to change sign. So the second derivative changes sign either side. So we need to go a little bit to the left and see what it's doing and a little bit to the right and see what it's doing. Now, what is what the hell is this measuring? the second derivative. It's measuring concavity. So concavity is about the curvature of the curve. So there's a big difference between this sort of curve and this sort of curve. And this is the definition of an inflection point. An inflection point is where the graph switches from concave to convex or vice versa. That is the definition of an inflection point. Concavity is measured by the second derivative because it's the rate at which the rate of change is changing. So it's a bit like acceleration. If the acceleration is the acceleration is the rate of change of the velocity, the velocity is the rate of change of the position. So concavity is a bit like measuring acceleration. So for concave, the second derivative is negative for concave. And what that means in terms of the graph is that if I draw two, a line between two points, then it will be under the curve. I always think of it as caves are underneath the ground. 
And I just don't remember anything for the other one because it's the opposite, right? So if concave is where the line is under, also negative, that makes me think of under and below and to the left, yeah? Getting more and more negative. So I just remember that concave, second derivative is negative, the line is under the graph, it's all like a cave. And then convex is the other one. So convex is where it's over. The line is over the graph. The second derivative is positive at a con if where the graph is concave. And then here's our inflection point, which is where it changed. So it goes from a negative to a positive um, second derivative. And then at the inflection point itself, the second derivative is zero. You don't need the third derivative to prove, oh, you could get the third derivative to prove it's an inflection point, yes, because if the second derivative, so say I'm measuring d squared y by dx squared, and here is my point where the second derivative is naught, but I'm still not sure whether it's an inflection point, what I need to know is, does it change sign? Does it go like that? In which case, yes, that's an inflection point. Or say I plot d squared y by dx squared. There is it zero, it might not be an inflection point. Is the graph going down? If so, yes, that's an inflection point because the second derivative changes sign. What about if I draw the second derivative and that's where it might be an inflection point and the second derivative looks like that? No, that's not an inflection point. So sometimes you see, instead of saying the second derivative changes sign, you see third derivative isn't zero. The derivative of the derivative of the derivative is not zero. Because in order to be naught but not change sign, the second derivative needs to have a maximum or a minimum at that point, which means its derivative is zero. So you can use, instead of changes sign, d cubed y by dx cubed does not equal zero. But that's not what they're expecting you to do. They're expecting, yes, exactly, the third derivative is not zero, but they're expecting you just to check either side. Okay, so let's do this one. At, forget the first derivative, okay? Nothing at all to do with the first derivative. It's all the second derivative. The second derivative is not, Perfect. So it might be an inflection point. It might not be an inflection point. A stationary point is a max and min. Inflection points could be stationary. They might be stationary, but they might not be stationary. So what I'd need to check is, does it change sign either side? So if you put in something a bit smaller than one, that would be negative. If you put in something a little bit bigger than one, like 1.1, it would come out positive. So yeah, it changes sign either side or you could say the third no you wouldn't lose the marks if you did the third derivative if you said d cubed y by dx cubed equals six which does not equal naught therefore so long as you've got these two make it really clear that you understand those two things exactly the same with a minimum there are two conditions for a minimum two conditions for a maximum two conditions for an inflection point okay now most of the questions that you get are going to be about finding where graphs are concave or convex or have inflection points. So we need to know that convex and concave, what are the conditions? There's also increasing and decreasing. So if we want to find out where a graph is concave, that means we solve this equation. The second derivative must be negative. And then we get an inequality and we solve it. Just like if a graph is going down, if it's decreasing, then we would say the first derivative has to be negative. And then the opposite for the other two. So where is a graph convex? A graph is convex at any point where the second derivative is positive. Where is a graph increasing? A graph is increasing for any point where the first derivative is positive. That's all you need to actually know, but then we can apply it to all sorts of different questions. But the knowledge is just that. Right, I want to work with you on um, playing around with a graph and seeing if we can find out what the um, different points are. What's the maximums? What's the minimums? Where is it convex? Where is it concave? What does that mean for sketching? And I've got two, three options for you, actually. I've got uh, this one 
x to the four minus four x cubed plus 10, that's number one. You can choose your favorite. Or we could do this one, x to the five over three minus five x to the two over three. We're gonna sketch that because God knows what that looks like. You know, that's not one of your standard graphs by any stretch, nor is the other one. Two x plus cot x, that's a nice one. That's number three. And number four is x plus sine x. Right, go vote, what do you want? One, two, three, or four. One was the polynomial, x to the four. Two is the one with the cubes and five cubes and two cubes and stuff. Three is the one with cot and four is the one with sine. Four, three, one, two, four, four, one, hardest one. Second one, so far nothing is winning. We need more votes. One has won. One has got three votes. That was the biggest one. Yeah, I think one is the winner, but then we can do another one after if you like. Okay, so grab a piece of paper. We'll do three nets, we'll do one then three. Grab a piece of paper. What I would like you to do first is to um, find dy by dx and find d squared y by dx squared. That's gonna be really, really easy peasy. Then we're gonna have a look for some stationary points. Now stationary points are maximums, minimums, and possibly inflection. Some inflections are stationary, some inflections are not stationary. So stationary, you would need to solve dy by dx equals naught. Okay, then you're gonna split them up. Are they a maximum or a minimum or neither? Well, actually it's not neither, it's don't know. So max is where the second derivative is negative. Min is where the second derivative is positive. Don't know is everything else. Have you done your sketch? Nelly, have you done your sketch? What does this one look like? Yeah, no, graphical calculator is no good, all right? Graphical calculator is fine for checking, but what they're gonna do in the exam is they're gonna introduce here, a, like that four won't be a four, it'll be a P, okay? That's really important. This, what they, they deliberately are constructing questions that mean that you can't just type it in your calculator for graph sketching. So what they will do is they will make that just a letter like K or P or something. And then they will expect you to have stationary points that include the letter K or P and for your, and they'll tell you whether P is positive or negative. So it's, you must be able to do these sketches and think about the derivative and the concavity outside of your graphical calculator, really, really. Yeah, my, it is buffering, but I don't know why, because my, I just saw that it was buffering and I just checked my um, internet and it's totally fine. Yeah. Hiya. Um, I think it's the streaming or something. My internet is totally fine, but on YouTube it's got every it's buffering for everyone, including me. Oh dear. 
says working again. Is, is it? Because it, otherwise it might not be working for you either. It's still blurry, but it's stopped buffering. Yeah. It's not blurry. It's not blurry on my screen. It's not. It's something to do with the way that it's streaming. I'm just, um, if you can hear me guys, I'm just talking to Rich. He's helping me to have a look and see if we can sort it out. Oh, maybe it's the, did you, did I, um, it's, the, it's the ghost from earlier. When I was teaching the first years, suddenly they were like, what's behind you? And there's nothing behind me. Oh, well, I can hear myself there. Yeah, it's, I can hear sound. Oh, that's miles behind, isn't it? Is it? Okay. I'll refresh. Cool. Okay, thank you. Great. Speak to you later. Bye. Okay, hey, it was fixed merely by me talking to Rich Warburton because that's how good he is. Okay, I want to move on to the derivative proofs and we only have 13 minutes. So let's go through this one quickly. So concave points on the graph and convex sections of the graph is to do with the second derivative. The first derivative is 4x cubed minus 12x squared. The second derivative is 12x squared minus 24x. The first derivative is naught. I'm going to pull out 4x squared. And so x is 0 or x is 3. Yeah? Stationary points are when x is 0 or when x is 3. Stationary points are where derivative is naught. That's it. Okay, but which one is it? So if we stick x is naught into the second derivative, it comes out as zero. So that one we still don't know. That's a don't know situation. If we stick x is three into the second derivative, we get nine times 12 minus 24 times three, which is positive. So that one is a minimum point. Okay, so we've got one minimum point so far. Now we look at inflection points. Now inflection points, remember, nothing to do with the first derivative at all. Everything to do with the second derivative. So when is the second derivative naught? I'm going to pull out 12x. The second derivative is naught at naught and at 2. So potentially we've got two inflection points here. Okay. Two inflection points. First, infle po first possible inflection point is x is zero. Second possible inflection point is when x is two. So for an inflection, d squared y by dx squared is equal to zero. And then that splits up into the ones where d cubed y by dx cubed is not zero. And the ones where d cubed y by dx cubed is zero. And this corresponds to the second derivative changing sign. Change in sign of second derivative. That's what we're looking for. So let's do that. Let's take the third derivative. It's probably easiest. It's 24x minus 24. So when we stick in zero, we get minus 24. So that means tick, tick, that's an inflection point. What about x is two? When we stick x in is two, we don't get zero. So this is not an inflection point. Because it doesn't change sign. The second derivative does not change sign. So overall, this is what the sketch looks like. I did it earlier so that I could draw it for you without being in too much of a rush. Um, let's do it here. It goes like this. It goes down and then has an inflection point. And then it's convex for a bit. And then it goes down like that and it goes down like that. And then it goes up like that. And that's the minimum point that we found. 
there. And this section of the graph is concave. This section of the graph is convex. And then that section of the graph up there is very, very steeply convex. That's what it ends up looking like. Now, probably you won't need to be sketching things using concavity and inflection points, but it's worth you knowing what it means, basically. It's a fairly simple thing to do. Right, what I would like to do now with you for the last nine minutes is to go back to our plan for today. We've talked about the derivatives, the derivative of sine, cos, tan, sec, cosec, cot, e to the x, a to the x, ln x, and x to the n. We've talked about inflection points being where the second derivative is zero and it changes sign. Talked about convex and concave being to do with the second derivative. And I would like to go over the derivative proofs, okay? You're expected to know how to prove every derivative apart from e to the x, every other derivative. So let's have a look. Let's get a free page, we'll use this one. So, Sine and cos will do later their first principles. Let's differentiate tan. Okay, grab a piece of paper. I'm gonna give you instructions, but you're going to do it. We're gonna do the quotient rule. V du minus u dv over v squared. V, it's not a pen, v du minus u dv over v squared. The v is the cos x and the u is the sin x. So what I would like you to write down is v derivative of u minus u and then the derivative of v divided by v squared. Okay, when you've done that, I'd like you to tidy up the top. Just see what you can do with it. It should be, yep, this is called the quotient rule. It's how you differentiate a fraction. So just tidy the top up. If you look at the top, you should be able to see that you can tidy it up. And then I would like you to write the final answer and you should have arrived nicely at sec squared x. Let me know when you get there. And then we're gonna do it another way and another way and another way. Well, actually only one other way. Excellent, excellent. Now you can use the quotient rule to differentiate tan by writing it as sine x over cos x. You can use it to differentiate sec by writing it as one over cos x. You could differentiate cosec x by differentiating one over sine x. You could differentiate cot x by differentiating one over tan x even. Or you could do cot x by writing it as cos x over sin x. All of these things can be written as a quotient and therefore we can use the quotient rule to differentiate them. But I'm now going to make it much harder. I'm gonna do the exact same thing, tan x, but, oh no, don't make it all go. Okay, fine, make it all go. We're gonna do tan x, but differently. The derivative of tan x, I want to write it like this. Instead of sine x over cos x, I want to write it as sine x times one over cos x. That's legitimate. Legitimate. Sine times one over cos times the tops times the bottoms, that's tan. So let's write that more nicely. It's the derivative of sine x sec x. Oh, Sine x sec x is tan x. The more you work with these things, the more you get to see the connections between them. So sine x sec x is tan x. Now what I'd like you to do is use the product rule. This is u, this is v. The product rule says that you to differentiate uv, you do 
u times the derivative of b plus v times the derivative of u. So you are going to be doing u times the derivative of v plus v times the derivative of u. And then what you're going to be doing is to have a little fiddle around with it and try and turn it into what we know is the derivative, sec squared x without going on. Excellent question. What is the derivative of sec? The derivative of sec is sec x tan x. Until you know these inside out and back to front, these 10, you're not going to be able to integrate. And integration is huge. You have to know these 10 derivatives inside out and back to front. Okay. The, yeah, the derivative of sec is sec x tan x. Yes. Okay. The derivative of sine x is cos x. The derivative of sec x is sec x tan x. So quite often what they're going to do in these exams is they're going to mix up or not mix up, but um, the skills of integration, differentiation and trig are all brought together. That, so it's really trig and calculus is just maths. It's being able to do maths and keeping them separate is why often students get really muddled because your brain is so into, I am differentiating, I am integrating, I am doing trig, that when you're integrating, your brain goes, well, I'm not doing a trig proof. Why would I be bringing forward trig identities? This is no good. And this is the sort of question um, that you might get. This could easily be an exam question. Write tan x as sine x sec x and use the product rule to prove that the derivative of tan x is sec x. Okay, let's see how it works out. I think I'm just gonna have to do this because sorry about this, but the, um, the think it's freezing if I use, if I use arrays. Okay, so hold one still, differentiate the other one. Plus, hold that one still while you differentiate that one. Now I'm gonna show all my working because it would be a show that question. Um, Dreadnought, there are September exams for those who are not happy with their calculated results. They may not be in September, it depends how everything goes with the pandemic, but they are gonna be as early as possible in the autumn term. If you wait to find out your calculated grade, you are not gonna have enough time to fully revise. So we are doing at TT, we are doing a gentle one hour a day revision um, and consolidation. And that's gonna continue until all those calculated grades come out. When they come out, we'll work with the people who need to do the September exam, but it means that we'll already be in a really good position, okay? Check, yeah, the examulance is on the Taylor Tutors website and it is free. Right, let's do this. Let's write down everything as a fraction. Sine x over one times one over cos x times sine x over cos x. It's so good to use this little over one trick because then we've got fractions and it's easier to see what's going on. Plus one over cos x times cos x over one. Okay, they cancel, so that's just the number one. And on the top, I've got sine squared x and on the bottom, I've got cos squared x, make it a really big plus, equals tan squared x plus one. And we know our Pythagorean identities and they tell us that tan squared plus one is x squared. Boom. Okay. So job for today, if you want to, but you don't have to. Okay. Go into the content guide. You've got your examulance for the next 24 hours. All of these ones that I tick are going to be available free. Okay. You can also go into the revision notes and watch the revision notes. It's one page. It's half an hour. All of your notes on differentiation. I'll try to put some links into the examulance to make it easier for you. So the Taylor Jeter's notes on what we've covered today are number 20, number 21, and number 28, and also the proofs. Oh yeah, that's 28. So the proofs of all of the derivatives are in that lesson there. So it's the proof that a to the x is a to the x ln a, the proof that ln x is one over x, the proof that sec x is sec x tan x, okay? It's all there for the next 24 hours. Every 24 hours, I will change it to what we're doing that 24 hours. And that's gonna hopefully keep you motivated and on board with what we're doing. Timer has gone. Action hour is up. Okay. 
The really important thing about action hours is that you stick to the timer. You might be halfway through something and think, oh, I'm just going to finish the thing, but don't stick to the actual rules. The rules are we now stop for 15 minutes, okay? So 10 or 15. And when I say stop, I mean stop. I mean get up, walk around, do other stuff. Communicate with me inside the course or inside the ambulance. Rich is on at two and three with chemistry AS and then chemistry A2. And I will be back at four to do a study hour with you um, on whatever you like, basically. It's just going to be a focused action hour at four o'clock. Let me know if you've got any questions at all. I know this is very rushed and you, a lot of you have only just found out about TT and you're not sure what's going on. So do use the comments in the course to ask us questions so that we can help. I will see you at four for tomorrow.